You tired? Who? Me? Nah. I can go, just go on a marathon around the freaking boot of Europe. <laughs> I'm just so full of energy, guy. Pal? Buddy? Yeah. <laughs> buddy, guy, pal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, you just came back from Italy, right? Yes, I came back from Italy to from my trip to Italy. Oh, right. Well, what, did, what, what, what did you do? I don't know you. Okay, I don't know your so, life. Okay, so you know that uh, particular type of ham you English-speaking people refer to as bologna? Yes. I went to the city that's actually named that. There's a city called bologna? No, it's a city named Bologna. And, uh, which Bologna. you people would pronounce baloney for yeah, some probably reason. Pronounce baloney. Yes, because uh, the famous ham by the same name comes from that town. So I went to the fair city of Bologna, which is uh, actually the safest city in my country, at least st statistically speaking. Oh. It's a nice little place to live in. I get lost all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are no recognizable landmarks for me. So, no. <laughs> then again, um, I am not known for having a great sense of orientation to begin with. So, there's that yes. to keep into consideration. But anyway, podcasting time with Mad Dog and Friends. Friend. Singular. <laughs> yes, there you go. I'm just one guy, one Y boy. <laughs> Yes, why, boy, why? And hence, we are doing a video podcast because, believe it or not, it's much easier on me editing-wise. Because if we were to do a audio podcast, I would be all completely OCD about it. I would have to work incessantly to make the audio as better as possible, which means going on into it and erase manual erase every time somebody breathes and yep, the background like... noises <gasps> yes but since we're doing a video podcast and you can see us my brain tells yeah. me it is not as important in that case Don't my brain worry, works in uh, weird ways <laughs> that i cannot quite conjure up and <laughs> think just the brain it's, uh, it's an asperger brain i yeah. Science is not quite there yet. <laughs> yeah, I get that sort of issue with just any sort of project. <laughs> Even for my video video projects for watch and stuff and such, I delete all all the breaths that I can. Yes. But anyway, this is a nice, relaxing and relaxed podcast. No mental illness here. Uh, it's not a mental illness. It's more of a, a cognitive deficiency, but you don't care about that. Okay, so uh, I just wanted to talk about what I did at the Future Film Festival. Specifically what I watched, because that's all I really do. Yeah. I go there. I go into the place that the festival is taking place in, which is this little old-fashioned cinema with a plaza right in front of it. And uh, mm, you cannot see much of the place in my vlogs, which, by the way, I record using my phone uh. for easy-to-make content. Uh, but uh, the place is actually quite nice. It has a homey feeling to it. You always feel welcomed, and I know I do feel welcome because uh, I actually have been consistently coming to this place since 2012. Nice. Which is about five years by now. 
Oh, which wow. It's <laughs> about the same amount of years I spent at the Venice Film Festival in between 2008 and 19, 19, 12, and 13. Uh, wow. You definitely go to a lot of movies then. Yes. So, as you can imagine, my. Uh, standards when it comes to quality of filmmaking and storytelling are mm, quite elevated <laughs> and then i watch nerdland <laughs> yeah uh, but okay what i really like about this festival uh, philosophically speaking is that um I enjoy this about film festivals in general, in that you can see films otherwise you would not be exposed to in regular film theatres. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Even though technically you could see everything online, uh, y you would have to look for them, and, and if you don't know what to look for, um, you can never find it, logically speaking. So, uh, film festivals are a great platform for you to get acquainted with authors and uh, styles of both visual and uh, narrative storytelling and theming and uh, just something different in general that you might not have the chance to uh, see otherwise. Yeah. And that is like a, a gateway drag for you to explore new frontiers. I especially like the Future Film Festival because it focuses on uh, animations and uh, the techniques related to animation that would uh, provide an evolution for the medium of cinema and the art itself. Nice. It is very nice. For example, this year uh, they have a different focus every year, a focused overarching theme, if you will, a leitmotif. This year is a thing called uh, Character Wow. Character Wow. So it's, it's something that basically <laughs> just makes the audience have to go wow to it. Something more uh, grand. No, no it's okay. nothing like Catholicism Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so what world of warcraft wow uh no it has an even dumber mascot uh essentially they have a different mascot every year this year is like every bad rejected idea for a 90s mascot just crammed together into something intelligible i hate that little monster so much but anyway uh the what, focus what, what is, is about it? What I can, is it? That's the problem. I cannot even physically describe it. It's completely incomprehensible. I guess that's the point. Uh, the focus is all about uh, the study of characters, essentially. How to make characters for your films, the study behind a character, all the jolly good stuff. Characterization okay. and also character design. That's a nice okay. little thing. That's more clear now. You know, the wow yeah. aspect. <laughs> yeah, I don't get wow. What, what, wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't get what character wow means for that. I would just I would just say like it's supposed to be character studies and also character animation studies, something like that, I would say. It's the theme for people. <laughs> character wow doesn't mean anything to me. Except well, for wow we Well it's a catchy hashtag, I guess. You know? Character wow. Yeah. I had to do That's... this. I am legally required to do this every time I say wow. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, okay, so like every year, I have something that I have a gripe with, with this festival. Um, specifically because the film I think should win, the main competition does not win, and all of that. What can you do? I am not the one in the jury, so... I don't know the people in the jury, it's their decision, I can just live with it. However, there is something that bothers me greatly this year. So, you know which film won? Ugh. Do I know? No, I don't know anything about okay, this film uh, festival. It's a rhetorical question. You might know it as soon as I finish uploading my vlogs on YouTube and I reveal yeah. it to you, but I'm going to spoil it to you right now. Um, a Monster Calls was in the main competition, mm -hmm. and it was the film that won. Yeah. Now, okay, follow my logic. 
First of all, A Monster Calls is not even technically an animated film, but it really doesn't matter at this point, because the festival is really uh, about celebrating the art of filmmaking, and uh, there are a lot of films realized with mixed techniques of live action and traditional animation or CGI. A Monster Calls was one such film. It had uh, yeah. fully animated segments that were also very good to look at and of course we had uh, Liam Neeson as a monster tree a yeah. nice motion capture in that regard now the reason why it bothers me that this film won it's, it's because it's a mainstream Hollywood film uh, you wanted something that was, <laughs> that was not as well known I, mean, like I was more thinking because I seen the monster calls and I would say it's a very good movie there were just some bits in it that just sort of threw me off. Okay. Where it just sort of, yeah. But yeah. it's review territory. Go. Let's review A Monster Calls right now. Because I think, as so, that it is a good film. It definitely moved me at the end. But I could not just get that knowing little feeling inside my heart that told me that this film really did not deserve to be as moving as it was. You want me to tell you why? I bet why you already that? know the answer. <laughs> tell me your answer, because I probably have a little different answer. <laughs> so, what is the emotional centerpiece of the film? The emotional crux? The one character in which everything revolves around? The boy's mother dying. That's what I would boy's say. Boy's mother dying. What yeah. do we know about the mother other than the fact that she's dying? We know the partial bits of characterization where she's just all a little bit goofy with her son and such and just trying to play her sickness off a bit to just make him feel better. But that's basically it. We don't really get much about her backstory or any sort of characterization beyond that. We're just seeing how she reacts to her sickness now. And that is the problem. The film spends so much of its time to make us feel sad about the boy because of what he's going through and all the early teenage angst. But it doesn't stop for a moment thinking that all of this might have some actual weight if we knew more about the mother as a character and if we had more scenes with her and her son spending time together so that we can get attached to his emotional plight a bit better. Because as it stands right now, the mother is not a character, she is a plot device that has to die to make us feel sorry for the male protagonist. And that is such mm -hmm. a devious and insufferable narrative cliche. Yeah. And to see it in a film in 2017, just tells me that we as a society have still a lot more to go before we can get rid of such idiotic cliches. And that is the one what? thing, that is the one thing that I am just angry at the movie for. We know a lot more about the grandmother and the father. Those are fully developed characters, but the mother is just there because she has to die. Mm hmm yeah. Like, for cliches, in my sort of opinion, like, I don't feel cliches will disappear in any any form down the line. They some may get, like, should. little known use. <laughs> I know some should, but cliches are always going to be around, because common ideas will be shared around by everybody. Like, that's not where I sort of fell with the movie. I did feel that was a little bit artificially written, with the mother being more used as a plot device. Yeah, but I was just more thinking, like, what threw me out of the movie and the emotions of it was the bullying aspect of it. Oh yeah, the yeah. cartoonishly evil bullies. As soon as I saw them, I was like, oh dear lord. Speaking of yeah. cliches that need to die a horrible death. Yeah, yeah. basically, let me just preface sort of my thoughts on it. Like, the whole theme of the movie is just sort of like, there's two sides that dip to any sort of situation where neither side is like good or evil or anything like that. And it's very well told in all these little animated segments. But then when we get back to reality, we have these bullying segments in the movie where the main character's being pushed around by this one bully guy, just pushed to the ground, getting beaten up and all that. Although, I will say this, I did enjoy that very specific twist 
that was tied with the bullying itself. Because it is revealed that the boy actually wanted the bullying as a form of self-punishment due yes. to what is actually is his uh, uh, personal conflict that's revealed at the end. And you know what? That's a pretty interesting and bold uh, conflict to yeah. have in your film about boy growing up and yeah. learning yeah. about death and grief. Yeah, I think that's good. But when you turn in it around, theory. you just know, Yeah, when you have the bully who would basically say, like, oh, well, your mother has cancer, but I'm going to beat the shit out of the cancer kid, basically. And just afterwards, just like, oh, well, I'm going to stop bullying now. But, oh, yeah, apologies about your mom. You know the kid's mom has cancer, and you're still beating the shit out of him. Oh, yeah, there's. let's see what the good and bad side of this. We are approaching a uh, bridge to therapy levels of writing in the bullying scenes. Yeah, because there's really no reason. He's just bullying the kid to bully the kid. <laughs> yeah, okay, so it is an imperfect film. It has yeah. its good moments, but to me, specifically, that one aspect of the mother not being an actual character ruins it. Yeah. More than the bullies being so cartoonishly over the top. It's not, not even that it sort of ruins it for me. It just sort of ruins the through-line theming of the movie. As it's just like, oh, very good theming, very good theming. And then it's just this moment just like, where's the good and evil of this? This guy's just bullying him for the sake of bullying him. What's the good in that? Yes, it is especially baffling considering the three stories narrated by Liam Neeson Tree were about how complicated and difficult human beings are. And then we have the one-dimensional bullies. Hey, I'm here to bully you. Well, see ya, I'm bullying you know, someone else later, see ya. <laughs> okay, so... All of that aside, a monster course wins the Grand Platinum Prize. And it bothers me because it was uh, the least interesting film, really, in the main competition this year. This year had some real great entries in terms of uh, variety and visual creativity and the theming and all of that. I mean, we had When Black Birds Fly by Jimmy Screamer Claus. And believe you me, watching this film on the big screen is a whole different experience that cannot be put into words. Yeah, it is I such a bizarre and yet completely clever experience it makes sense that's the thing unlike its predecessor where uh, the dead go to go die, to die, die. damn titles i often get them confused yeah for the longest time i thought when blackbirds fly was titled where the birds go to fly <laughs> yeah Oh, it's, man. Yeah, it makes it even trickier when they're both start with just W words. And you, yes. It's easy to uh, mix them up. Don't miss the next film by Jimmy Screamer Claus when the donkeys go to us or something. Shit. Oh, that's probably uh, going to be one of his next ones. That's one of his titles, basically. Oh, man. But yes, like I said to you before, and uh, I wrote about it in our Facebook chat. I think this film is a legitimate masterpiece. I talk about it in uh, length in my vlogs, but I figure that since you already have the DVD of the film... Yes, I'll probably be watch watching it, it sometime. Yes, you have to watch it, it and then we can go back and properly dissecting and analyzing it. Because I think this film is great, and it is clear to me that where the dead go to fly, I mean die, <laughs> was nothing but the the training grounds before we actually made a real film. And uh, yeah. make no mistake, this one is the real deal. This is the film that cements Jimmy Screamer Claus in my mind as the insane genius that it had the potential to have in the first film. Yeah, Especially like in my since... own sort of review of uh, whether that go to die, I was really pointing out a lot of the scenes like, oh, this could actually be a very cool idea of these kids meeting this dog and going through these hell hell mind trips. It's style like over substance, ultimately. Yeah, 
Yeah, basically, yeah, exactly. That's basically the substance of everything. It's just like, oh, I look at this gross stuff on screen. Get yeah, but really like I said, by it. that was him experimenting with the the animation tools that he has and the video game engine he's using. Apparently, I yeah, don't know. I would, I would uh, say experimental drivel would yes, be more. Correct. I hear the damn dog in the distance. Yes, the dog, the dog, yes. damn you, dog. Where where the dogs go to die? <laughs> hey, leave my dog alone. He's adorable. Anyway, so where the dogs go to bark? There, next film. Yeah. But like I said, when the blah 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 go to fly is the real deal, and it is the real deal by accomplishing something that the first film could not accomplish, and that is having creepy, grotesque, symbolic imagery actually put into a context, a thematic context, which means they make sense with whatever narrative and theming the director mm -hmm. is going for. And it's great because uh, he's not subtle in the slightest, you know? Yeah. Yeah, Completely no, not subtle. <laughs> but the way he goes about it is that he takes a theme, he takes a, a notion of something and it completely eradicates everything about it and by the time you are done with this you realize that you've just been skull raped <laughs> but you're not unhappy about it because it gave you something to think about yeah from it's... the dvd cover that i had because i got when I did my original review of Where the Dead Go to Die, I got both of the DVDs personally autographed by Jimmy Screamer Class himself, even though I didn't ask him to. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. <laughs> but yeah, I got both of them. And just looking at the two DVDs, I just realized, like, Where the Dead Go to Die was completely disorganized, even just on the cover where everything was just strewn about and everything. But when you look at When Blackbirds Fly, I can instantly tell what it's trying to be. It's trying to be a dissection of a religion and just sort of the mob mentality that goes it's into that. more or less a complete uh, deconstruction and inflammatory commentary about uh, the very concept of faith, which is compared to lust and sexual objectification. And it mm -hmm. goes all out with it, as he should, because this is the kind of difficult subject matter that you can only succeed in making a film about it if you go all out if you don't restrain yourself and he did not i mean no i'm serious where the dead go to die feels restrained compared to this one and it is especially <laughs> compelling because there is a legitimate build up to the point where the film starts being absolutely insane <laughs> well that's good anyway you, you have the dvd though. why don't you show the dvd on oh, uh, the video, so gotta... video podcast let's uh, oh, yeah. take advantage uh, of that let me just see it's in my collection somewhere where the fuck did i place that <laughs> yeah, i got a whole bunch of dvd so i keep losing it sometimes just gonna bring my computer with me it is the plight of us uh film buffs and all of that well, there's where the dead go to die. Got it right there. To Taylor, Lavi, Lavi watches you masturbate. Stop it with a little heart on it. Yes, that's nice. Oh, by the way, of course, in the sequel, the spiritual sequel, at least, there are all the uh, brands of the trademarks that uh, are making Jimmy famous, which means we have a diabolical talking animal, and of course, we have. A scene of something coming out of someone's birth canal. Of and, course. And there is a proper build up to it, though. <laughs> <laughs> Entire minutes of film dedicated to that scene. Okay, here it is. When B Blackbirds fly, I think. So. Oh, yeah, worship came or die slow. <laughs> there we go. And there is a phone. Awesome. Yep. There is. There we go. Okay. Oh, but yeah, I do really prefer this DVD cover to the other one. And it's just so much more bolder to look at. Yes, uh, it has a proper composition. 
<laughs> Can you center yourself a little better? There we go. There we okay. go. Okay. Awesome. Right. So we are totally going to discuss that film sometime, sometime down the line once he watches it. But for now, let me tell you, I wholeheartedly recommend it. It's not for everyone. In fact, it's really for a niche variety of people. Uh, the kind of people that has a strong stomach, but it is bold, it is incensed, it is absolutely enraged and outraged, <laughs> and it wants you to feel disgusted, outraged, and incensed, but for all the right reasons. Yeah, and not like the first one where it's just trying to insult you for <laughs> basically insult all your senses. But like I said, the first one is just him experimenting with his available tools. Now, this one feels like a proper film. <laughs> well, he's experimenting with proper tools and also doing doing some drugs during that as well. So it's experimenting and just also, he's just throwing his ideas out there. Just okay. seeing what hits. Because they're all short films in the end. Yes. But anyway, so that's one film that I watched <laughs> on uh, on Ciao, by the Ciao. No. Ah. No. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I'm the mother. <laughs> Ciao. Hello. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao, why not? <laughs> no, that happens sometimes. I might just leave that in. Yeah, because <laughs> I also just wanted to show you just some little gifts that Jimmy left in the DVD box. I got babies, 12 steps of happiness, this little sticker for when blackbirds fly. Oh, yes. And a little oh, mixtape yeah. as well. Yeah, you know, I actually get all of those references after yeah. watching the film. Dear Lord. <laughs> yeah. And they're oh. all just little added additions to the DVD. All right in there. Okay. So... <laughs> Uh, Get your like copy I today. said before, that was one of the films I watched at the Triple F. Another one was uh, Hitler's Folly by Bill Plimpton. <laughs> what was that about? Are you familiar with the work and career of Bill Plimpton? I'm assuming you are. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really know like names of many of the people in the industry. I just have uh, a hard time remembering people. You know, since you are the cartoon guy, I would assume you would know the name of the guy that's the inescapable point of reference for the entire independent animation scene in the USA. That's Bill Plimpton in a nutshell. No, no. well, none of the USA in Canada. Doesn't matter, you watch Scooby-Doo cartoons. Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> Most cartoons come from the USA. So, <laughs> it's a moot <laughs> argument. <laughs> but I watch a lot of Canadian <laughs> cartoons other than Scooby-Doo. I didn't even watch right. that much Scooby-Doo <laughs> back in the day. He says that, and yet his last Cartoon Corner video was about Scooby-Doo. <laughs> yes, I watched a lot of them when I got a little bit older, like six and up then. Okay, so as I was saying, Bill Plimpton is the inescapable figure, the mogul of the indie animation scene in the USA. I personally don't like his animation style, mostly because to keep his company afloat he has to make many cartoons, a whole lot of them, during one year. And uh, because of that they are often very cheap and very badly drawn. To begin with, it doesn't help since most of them have this slapstick humor without dialogues and uh, that really cheap animation and those really just genuinely bad drawings and character designed characters. Yeah. Uh, they don't lend themselves well for uh, slapstick. In fact, uh, even when you have uh, proper comedies with dialogues, the animation is still so bad, it's genuinely distracting, so I cannot enjoy them. I don't really like Bill Plimpton's style in general. Yeah. Even acknowledging his importance in the uh, industry, I don't really care for him. However, yeah. Hitler's Folly 
is freaking brilliant. Absolutely hysterically brilliant. <laughs> and one of the reasons why, it's because it's not animated. So I don't have to stare to his just ghastly characters and cheap animation. This one is a mockumentary. Okay. <laughs> it's a mockumentary that reimagines Adolf Hitler as a successful animator and the leader of the uh, animation industry in Europe. Essentially, the joke premise of the film is what if Adolf Hitler was Walt Disney? Uh, yeah, I was just sort of picturing that. Like, did he do a I was going to ask, did they do a Disney comparison? Like, uh, oh, <laughs> yes, the film is littered with parallels to Walt Disney's life and career. It's not she subtle about that. I mean, Bill Plimpton taking hot shots at Walt Disney? <laughs> no, it's not like he's ever done that before. <laughs> okay, so the question that this film poses, uh, metaphorically speaking, is that how far can you take a premise and run with it for uh, more than an hour of film? The answer is... You can just do a home run with it because it is absolutely lambasting and just just funny. It is just a really funny satire of both the animation industry and also about uh, the trend of alternative history facts, nice. if you will. It's just so good and it is especially poignant at points when it is revealed that uh, Adolf Hitler, as uh, the German Disney, was actually a much better employer than Disney himself. <laughs> because nobody yeah. was pulling strikes over outrageous working conditions. Yeah. There are a few jokes here and there that are just to die for. I don't want to spoil them to you, but what I find really compelling is how the whole film is structured. Because it is mostly structured like a documentary, but it has very specific found footage film tropes thrown in it for good measure to book end and book start the film. Yeah. If you, if you will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said to you before, I won't spoil some of the funniest jokes but they have something to do with both the typical Nazi salute, the Nazi strut military walk, <laughs> and also concentration camps. Wow. <laughs> it's really good. And I just love this image of uh, Adolf Hitler as this guy who had a dream and wanted to spread his love for cartoons <laughs> throughout the entire world, and he's misunderstood for that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, and you know why there is a war? There is a war over the distribution rights of uh, the titular Hitler's folly, which is his ease reimagining of uh, the Ring of the Nibelungen Epic, starring his uh, cartoon mascot, which is Downy Duck. Uh, <laughs> Downy Duck. <laughs> that just sounds like a clinically depressed duck. <laughs> That may be the joke. <laughs> so, yes, this is very funny. This is the funniest film I've seen all year long. It's really good. This is just uh, Bill Plimpton's comedy writing at its finest, without his uh, ghastly animation. He <laughs> should make more live-action films more often. And I want to bite my own tongue for saying that, because I always prefer animation over live action, but yeah. sometimes the medium is more suited for very specific things as opposed to others. And yeah. uh, the mockumentary structure really suits the comedic style of uh, Hitler's folly. And by the way, the title is clearly a reference to Disney's folly which was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs back in oh. the day. Eh? Okay. Eh? Yeah. Eh, eh, clever. Eh. Yeah. So clever. So essentially, if you are a fan of cartoons 
and you're also a fan of the history of animation, you will definitely enjoy this. And even if you're not, the premise, the joke of the premise, it's just so funny and it's so right, you will have a good time regardless. Nice. That does sound really good and something I would actually really enjoy watching. Yes. You should definitely get it. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else I've seen. Hmm, there are a lot of interesting films. Oh, they actually uh, broadcast. Broadcast. What am I saying? They actually shown a 4K remastered edition of a very, very rare gem of a 1970s classic, which is Belladonna of Sadness. Belladonna Have you heard of, of that one? No. It has an interesting and troubled history. It was the last film by Mushi Productions, which was the company once uh, founded by Osamu Tezuka. You know, the okay. god of manga. Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. You know, father of Astro Boy and uh, about a million other characters. The company went into bankruptcy. Um, uh. Right before releasing this film, and... Uh, it is quite the journey. It has the most 1970s scenes I've ever seen. Oh, so, um, so just the blue sky and all that? No, I'm talking about aggressive, incensed, rapid-fire, LSD-induced nightmares. Oh, I see. Also, a lot of sex. Because it's mm. the 1970s. <laughs> Sexy years. <laughs> and it is a rather uh, grimy and gritty story of a woman that gets raped by an entire castle court. Wow. And then makes a pact with the devil and she becomes a witch. It's definitely more style over substance, ultimately. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that in this specific case, the style is the substance. Because it is quite a unique and enthralling style. There's barely any animation to speak of, it's mostly still images, but the scenes that are actually animated feel more special because of that. Okay. Also, there is that brand of synthetic 1970s music that just blasts <laughs> through your brain and it feels like you are legitimately experiencing the inside of an LSD cyclone. Oh, no. It's been quote-unquote lost for many years. You can easily find it on YouTube, actually. But now to see a proper remastered version on the big screen, what an experience. It was the very last film that I watched at the Triple F. It was a very nice way to finish up um, this year's edition. So you watched just those three three movies that you that you listed? I yeah I watched about uh, I don't know fifteen movies, not <laughs> counting what? not counting the various short films. Those must have been over a hundred. I don't know. Uh, 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 my memory of it is a bit hazy because I would be there all day, all night. Basically, typically from uh, ten in the morning to uh, two in the night. Or oh, well. early morning of the next day. That is impressive. <laughs> what that I is. am passionate. Yeah, I can tell. In between being seated to see a film, from being seated to see the next film, right after it, uh, I spent some time in uh, the premises and uh, in uh, line for entering in the room, that is. Right? That's what you yeah. do. But anyway, in those down times, you know what I did? What? I read Slightly Damned on my phone. Oh, yeah. And this was all an elaborate ruse to get us talking about Slightly Damned. This is the longest segue in the history of segues. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> so, I have to say... Slightly Damned, which you actually recommended at some point in our now defunct Paper Pit podcast, which yeah. lasted not even four episodes, three and a half. 
Yeah, three and a half. Yeah. Better than nothing. But I figure that we can actually talk more about comics in our regular podcast because Mm -hmm. it's an all-purpose podcast at this point. Yeah. Slightly Damned might be the easiest read that I've come across on the internet for free, that is. Yeah. Um, I mean that in the best possible way. It is a very efficient page turner in that regard. Mm-hmm. I like how the story and uh, parallel to that the characters are uh, consistently billed as uh, the comic progresses. And uh, the linear structure of it makes sure that uh, the story remains relatively simple and mostly character-driven, up until you get to that one point in the story that reconnects with the very first arc of the comic itself in a pretty smooth and uh, coherent sort of, way. Yeah, coherent way, yeah. Yeah, I would definitely have to agree with you there. Like, slightly, Dan, for me, like, I've been... <laughs> reading it for a, bit, for a few years now, and I just haven't really stopped since. Like, the one problem for me is, like, some pages don't come out as often as I would like to, and I'm just so hooked on the story. As it yes, was just I mean, flowing so well. Currently, like, we're since... in the middle of fire and brimstone, and I cannot wait what happens next. At this point, yeah, it's, it's just so like a very page. gripping. Yeah, and it says a page comes out and it's like, oh, that's only a minute later in the story, give me more time with it. I have to say, for me personally, since I basically binged read the entire thing in a week, it was very interesting to witness the slow, methodic, but consistent improvement of the art style of the comic. I keep doing this a lot today, I don't know yeah. why, what's, what's wrong with my hand? I don't know, it's just flowing everywhere. Flowing. Anyway, (laughs) and I love how it started off as a quintessential amateurish anime fan art, essentially. Yeah. But then it eventually bloomed into its own recognizable visual style, full to the brim with background and character details. And while it is still homaging its initial character output, if you will, its original aesthetics, uh, it definitely feels unique and uh, this contributes in making these characters and the world they inhabit all the more charming and compelling. Yeah, I'm completely, I'm completely there with you. Like the artist, Chu, as she goes by online, mm-hmm. has definitely has a mass evolution over the years. I mean, it's been quite a few years. It started off in 2005, and it's still going right now. Not anywhere near the conclusion. Is it fair to say it's the longest-running webcomic right now, or one of the longest-running ones? Not counting the joke of the week formula, but the ones with a consistent, ever-progressive narrative? (laughs) Well, I'm honestly not sure, like, because I'm pretty sure she has some hiatuses between, like, all the arcs and such, so it wasn't all the way through these past 10 plus years. But she has been keeping pretty consistent with with the uploads for each of the arcs coming out. Like, this is probably the longest one so far that we're in right now. That's good. Mm-hmm. I was surprised at myself at how engrossed I became in the characters. Not just the main characters, mostly the main character, only, you know, if only by technicality, the main character. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I found myself engrossed in also some of the side characters, even the background characters. For example, there is this uh, demon couple, and apparently one of them is Death. So they communicate with each other through sign language. That is a cute little detail that makes these characters more rich. And Mm -hmm. if the characters are more rich uh, because of what is going on in their own lives and how it is informed to us visually, then the world they inhabit is uh, more interesting as well. Yeah, it's, just, it's those sort of positive inclusions that makes, makes this comic sort of the most progressive comic that I've seen yeah, to date. Like, probably the most LGBT-friendly comic I've ever read, to the yeah. point that it almost feels like pandering. I mean, we don't have just the gay couples, interspecies couple. We also have interspecies gay polyamory couples. 
Yeah. One specifically, which seems like an excess, but I dig it. Yeah, I dig it too. I don't even really feel it's an excess. It, it's, sort of, it's sort of the way it's written. It's sort of written in a way that it's just like, it's completely natural that it happens. Like, just yes. like another comedy thing. Like, even when you have like all those like stupid comedies out there that are basically just like, all oh, those straight couples, they're wacky here. <laughs> okay, but there is one little element that always bothers me when you have a fantasy world that's incredibly progressive about certain things but also incredibly backwards about other things mm -hmm. the two elements don't seem to mesh to me i mean this is a world in which uh, apparently interspecies gay polyamoric couples can be accepted now granted in very specific places yeah, and it's just this one area, really. But at the same time, angels, oh, demons, oh, oh, medians, oh. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit uh, incoherent to me. It's like playing Dragon Age 2. I mean, every possible sexual fetish and kink is uh, not only approved, but, but also encouraged. But, oh, I hate those elves. Oh, I hate those mages. Our mind doesn't work like that. Our mind is lazy. If we are close-minded towards how people uh, relationship with each other, we are most likely to be close-minded even if those people relationshiping with each other are of different races. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm just bringing real-world logic into this epic yeah. fantasy, but... Clearly, it is littered with uh, uh, themes that are paralleled with uh, real-world issues. That's why I'm bringing it up. But anyway, regardless, that's such a insignificant nitpick. But uh, it's it's a nice comic. It has some pacing problems every once in a while, especially in the early bits. But now it's going strong and. Uh, it's really well drawn. I cannot stress this enough. It's really well drawn. Yeah, it's a beautiful drawing style. It's, a, it's such a much more bolder style than I've seen in a lot of other comics. And with her, her way that she draws like fur and such, it just becomes a lot more fluffier to look yeah, at. Yeah, you have to say, to okay, we should mention this comic is the furry gateway. <laughs> gateway. Yeah. Also, also the furry get away with. <laughs> if you will yes so and she definitely can draw uh, anthropomorphic animal characters much better than she can draw human-like characters the human-like characters tend to be drawn all the same way honestly mm -hmm. she has this uh, predefinitive model of a human shaped body but when it comes to designing demons which are all the furry animals in the world also some <laughs> scaly ones they're all different and distinguished even when they are similar to each other like lazuli is somewhat similar to uh akido for mm -hmm. example but they are perfectly distinguishable it is implied that they are of a similar species type of demons but they're also different the same level of differentiation is not put into designing humans yeah Strangely <laughs> enough. Or angels. Yeah. But then again, it is something that's brought into our attention in the comics. The fact that angels are all supposed to be designed in a strict way determined by their society. And that's the limitations of their society. While demons are supposed to be wild and free. And also quite violent. Yeah, it's just sort of Generally the medians at the, in the middle of the sense that don't really get either side. They're just sort of like disorganized in between them with the same yes. body structures that you said. It's interesting, the choice for the main heroine of the story, which, as I mentioned before, she's the main heroine by technicality, because for the most part, the story seems to be really about uh, Buwaro and uh, Snowy, <laughs> I want yeah. to say, Kieri. Snowy yeah, being yeah. the nickname. The comic takes a huge detour in having us uh, trying to get invested in a romance, in a forbidden Romeo and Juliet romance. Yeah. I could not care less for that, honestly. 
I did not ask for teenage angst. Thank you very oh, much. I honestly like it. I think it's just cute. <laughs> the yeah, whole yeah. comic's just supposed to be about the cu the cuteness of it. Okay. Yes. The whole comic, in fact, the whole approach to uh, character writing and character design in this comic is like this. Oh, look at all these cute animals. Aren't they precious? I'm gonna love them and squeeze <laughs> them and dress them like a pimp. <laughs> yeah. Dress them like a pimp. This yeah. is the whole reason I wanted to do this review, so that I could just say this. Dress <laughs> them like a pimp. Done. Yes, that's the whole running gag with Buwaro in the human world, or uh, I should say the median world, because there are also the Jakai race. Mm -hmm. The whole gag is that uh, to mask his appearance, he has to dress like a pimp. Yeah. And this leads to all sorts of walkie misunderstandings. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But you know yeah. what? I think... We've been all over the place with this, but we didn't exactly explain what the plot of Slightly Damned is. Yeah. The main heroine, I was about to say what's great about the main heroine, in that if you see how she is designed, she seems like the kind of character that would be a obnoxious comic relief sidekick in any other story. I mean, if this were to be uh, Thundercats, she would be that freaking little furball that everybody hates, you know? Schneer. Schneer. Kind Schneer. of similar, too. I like her design. Apparently, she's part of the Jakai race, which is a race in Median, and it's a full-fledged fantasy world. Even without heaven and hell existing at the same time, the Median world would be just a pretty interesting and fascinating fantasy world in its own right, with its own races coexisting with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The addition of heaven and hell is just uh, some sort of nice bonus. Yeah. <laughs> I like her design. Uh, her name is... Uh, uh, what was it? Rhea. Yeah, Rhea. Rhea. I like her design because it reminds me of uh, Clonoa from the Clonoa series, you know. Clonoa yeah. Door to Phantom Isle on the PS1, Clonoa Lunatia's Bale on the PS2, which are two of my favorite games of all time. But I like her personality more. She started off pretty one-dimensionally being uh, this obnoxious spoiled brat, but again, as the comic goes on, the writing gets better, she gets more depth. And she is basically the caretaker and big sister to both yeah. Uwaru and Kieri, acting as a guardian almost and trying to help them as much as she can due to her own very personal uh, childhood trauma that basically becomes a pivotal moment in her character's growth. Mm -hmm. And it's always there in the background whenever she tries to do something to help a friend. Yeah, help a friend or help anybody else. Because basically her story is, the whole story of Slightly Dent is that Rhea is murdered by someone in her own clan and she goes to hell. But basically yeah, she's murdered and she goes to hell, but then yes. the Grim Reaper shows up and basically says like, well, well, you're, you're not good enough to go to heaven and you're not bad enough to go to the really bad hell, so you're going to the ring of Slightly Damned. I'm sorry, have you never heard of Purgatory? Yeah. yeah, well, she goes to the ring on the slightly damned instead. Which is just this desolate wasteland with nothing in it except rocks, rocks, and more rocks, and one incredibly moronic demon named Buwaro, which is the one who gets to dress like a pimp and has the forbidden Romeo and Juliet love story with the angel from Act 2 all the way to Act Now. <laughs> Yeah, and so basically from there, Ray and Buaro es escape from hell. Escape from hell. Now they're just trying to live their lives, just going With on the their own. The help of so. Buaro's sister, yeah. Akido. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, who dies? Spoilers. Yeah, that, that's, it's only like first act spoilers. They're all the way in there now. Okay. This is funny because the titular slightly damned. Uh, Circle of Hell, it's only in this story for the first act of nine. Yeah. 
Yeah, it is sort of weird. <laughs> Slightly misnamed. Yeah. You could say. Yeah, so basically the narrative from there is just basically their sort of misadventures as they are out of the slightly damned ring, ring of hell yes, and going they, through each misadventure, each of arc. Yes, they meet up with Kieri, this angel that was cursed by one of the elemental guardians of the medium. Let's call it the Earth Realm. And now yeah. they have to band together to defend the Earth Realm from Shao Kahn and, because he wants to conquer it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nah. But, uh, so, essentially, they are, for the most part, up until recently, in fact, they have been looking for uh, Kieri's older twin brother. Yeah. Why do they say older twin brother? And <laughs> his boyfriend, essentially, who have been lost in uh, Medium. Median. Yeah. Medius. Medium. Earth Realm. Yeah. Because apparently there are these occasional rays of light, which are portals, interdimensional portals, that bring both angels and demons into the Earth realm. And the dog <laughs> is slightly annoying. Yeah. But yeah, speaking of dogs, some of those demons look like straight up puppies. Yeah. Especially Iratu, which is uh, Buwaro's other sibling. Yeah. And I won't say more about that. Yeah. Because anything else would just be going to major spoiler territories. Yes, but anyway, the gist of it is that for the vast majority of the comic up until recently, they've been looking for Kieri's brother and his boyfriend. And uh, it was really all about Buwaro and uh Kieri just uh, growing attached to each other in a surprisingly organic yeah. manner. You know, even though I did not much care for Kieri's character for the most part because she seems like the quintessential sad, shy character. <laughs> I'm so sad all the time. <laughs> oh no, yeah. but I'm also so polite all the time. Oh no, this makes me blush. <laughs> And also her characterization, or I should say her story arc, is a bit all over the place, because it seems like the author has a very specific idea for her, and mm -hmm. then moving on, she has to come out with another idea that clumsily, slightly retcons whatever we knew about her background. Mm -hmm. Just for the sake of adding a new conflict that plays a role in that very specific act of the story. But she's not so bad. Yeah, I mean, no. she improves. Yeah, I sort of don't really mind her backstory. I should, I sort of found her backstory to be, be very poignant at some points, especially when you talk about the Angel Society a bit, how she was forced to dye her hair blue yes, to be but part of one thing. That's the thing, that comes much later on. You're mm -hmm. stuck with something else before that. You're stuck with uh, teenage angst and unnecessary drama around... You know, that uh, the unlikely forbidden romance, yeah. which, I, again, I did not much care for. Yeah. I can sort of just understand where it was go going there, because even throughout the entire first arc, they were more talking about how demon <laughs> demons, and e even when they were partially mentioning angels, they were just sort of setting up just sort of like the complete divide between hell, median, and, and heaven. And just why those two things wouldn't connect. Yes, the comic is actually doing a great job in bringing to the foreground the fundamental social issues in, you know, having demons and angels trying to coexist or even being romantically entangled with each other. I will not say much more about that, but it leads to some interesting scenarios. Yeah. Specifically having to do with uh, alignments to specific uh, ideals. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very interesting there. It's just sort of the reason why I follow the story to this day now. Aside from all of that, this is just a very easy read, as I said before, because it keeps story elements focused, it keeps uh, characters and their own progression as characters focused by keeping things simple, superficially simple at least, it is possible to convey more complex themes behind that 
uh, first layer of uh, simplicity. Yeah. And that's what happens. We have families breaking apart, emotional dramas, um, redemption arcs, and what have you. All developing organically with the overall journey of the main characters and the overall journey of us, the readers, as we read and follow along their adventures. Exactly. I think that's all I can say about it without uh, having major spoilers. Yeah, and I can't really say anything on top of that, because that's exactly why I like, like the series. Other than just adding on just the artwork, it sort of pulls me back in. Just definitely with the evolution of it coming to this the, point. I have to say, uh, I, I have to say, though, as good as the art style is right now, my gosh, Buaro went from being a just humanoid character with uh, some fur on him to be a full-on canine creature and yeah. to see him smooching the very human looking angel is somewhat disconcerting <laughs> you know <laughs> it's this is why i say uh, this is why i say this is the gateway for furries my gosh yeah. <laughs> my gosh <laughs> it's my good gosh. It's good, oh my, it's good regardless oh of my. that. But uh, I feel a bit icky. Yeah. <laughs> like, mm, you know, like mm. the guy from a community saying, this better not awake anything in me. Mmm, <laughs> <laughs> icky. Mm, why am I so weirdly engrossed in this? <laughs> and it is especially baffling when you have uh, furry, fully cartoon animal characters being gay with each other. It's kind of weird. I mean, the combination of furry and uh, LGBT friendly... I'm, <laughs> the meshing of the two seems a bit weird to me. I don't know, the meshing to me just sort, sort of seems to connect together, because I don't think it's weird when Boro kisses Kyrie. <laughs> Really at all. Uh, of to course me. you don't. You're already a furry. That is true. And LGBT. <laughs> well, yes, but mostly a furry. Yeah. <laughs> That's the important thing. <laughs> <laughs> because in this day and age, you don't have to do outing to say you're gay. You have to do outing to say you're a furry. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Uh, well, at least in the more progressive countries. Yeah, indeed. Thank goodness you're in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm very thankful to be here. Yes, Canada, where every one of your friends is either gay, drunk, or Asian. Scott Pilgrim taught me that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'm just... Uh, I'm just being... Uh, yeah, a... You're just joshing me. I'm just joshing you. <laughs> There you go. What does that even mean? Where does that even come from? I don't. I don't really know. I just. I just. I just know it's used for just kidding and such. Well, Jashes. you know what? Anyway, this was our spoiler-free discussion and analysis and review of Slightly Damned. If you feel like it was a bit all over the place, that's because it's difficult to properly extrapolate certain. Um, discourses related to this topic while avoiding spoilers. Yeah. Because the but, key of the whole comic is basically just to follow along in the adventure as it just progresses yes. through the... Or... It's a, mostly a character-driven narration up until a certain point in which something bigger than the characters themselves is taking place. But uh, it's one of those deals in which if you don't care for the characters, you won't care for anything else. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's true for most stories, unless, you know, Jimmy Screamer Close is writing them. In that case, you have to care for the visuals and the yeah. things behind it. But it is especially true in this case, because it's mm -hmm. mostly a character-driven journey. Yeah. And I like the characters. I really like Rhea. I think uh, she came on her own to be one of the most uh, fascinating main heroines or main characters in general to be found in comics. Just because the idea of uh, uh, the 
freaking furball from Thundercats <laughs> being the main character of an epic fantasy and also being a independent woman in the process <laughs> it is such an interesting concept in its own right just about as interesting as that one comic starring a mother of all things we talked about that one too in uh -huh. our paper pit podcast at some point it was yeah. uh, that uh opossum mother in a fantasy world yeah uh, I, that one but yeah. anyway so this is actually a great uh, moment for uh, web comics and web comic artists there's a lot of creativity going around a lot of variety too and yeah. they are free to read so really the only obstacle for your enjoyment of it is waiting patiently for the next update <laughs> yep exactly it is almost heart-wrenching when you realize you've come to the end of the currently available pages and now you have to wait for the next update just like everyone else yeah and the but, only way you can get a little bit faster is just do it through, through her Patreon. <laughs> That's the only way now. Yeah, she's still human. She still has to draw those pages. And considering how um, detailed and uh, well put together those pages are, that's an extra layer of work. Yeah, a lot of background work she has to do for each one. <laughs> yep. Also, don't forget lighting and shading. Dear yeah. Lord. <laughs> Yeah. So much work. But anyway, I'm glad I got to read it during my week at the Future Film Festival. I never had a dull moment. <laughs> so, yes. Um, this was mostly uh, me talking about stuff and why boy <laughs> listening. But then again, what else is different? I'm glad you watched a Monster Calls, at least, so we could actually talk about that one. Yeah. <laughs> well... <laughs> Yeah, we talked about Slightly Damned too. I've, I've read that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah and that's about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everything else I have not. <laughs> it Three was slightly one-sided. Slightly one-sided. <laughs> yeah. But it was still fun. <laughs> yes. Oh, and of course, I've been playing Persona 5 as of uh, this Monday, this past Monday. <laughs> yep, and I just completed Persona 5, my first playthrough. We'll do New Game Plus in maybe like a month or two. <laughs> Okay. I have a problem with the writing in the game. <laughs> well, especially in the first yeah. few hours, because... Okay, so... The whole story is about uh, kids, young people, uh, trying to regain their stolen future from the corrupted adults. Yeah. It's all about a generational redemption. Mm-hmm which most of us can relate with, especially in the conflict between millennials and baby boomers, a.e. current generation of uh, people trying to get a living for themselves, and old people in power basically knocking them down at every turn. Yeah. It's a compelling story, and it's compelling because of real-life issues tied up to it, especially in current Japanese society, if you're aware of that. Problem is, the way the game goes about in informing you of these themes is by employing the most on-the-nose writing imaginable. Yeah. Like, for example, every adult is characterized as this negligent, evil, downright scummy dirtbag that's completely unredeemable. And uh, also, little details such as this one. Um, how do you inform your audience that uh, this particular sleazebag is a corrupted political figure? By having them shout in drunken stupor that they will steer you like they steer this country to their will. Yeah. <laughs> the most natural sounding dialogues, really. Yeah, definitely <laughs> that. Definitely that didn't, didn't come, also, come out as most natural. What is the point? What is the point of employing elaborate metaphors about these Robin Hood style thieves 
literally stealing back their future from the clutches of uh, the corrupted adults. What is the point of having all of these visual metaphors if a character has to explain them constantly? It kills the point of a metaphor! <laughs> but all of that changed as soon as the cat turned into a bus. Yeah. I was happy with that. I was happy with the not my neighbor Totoro reference. That was that was really good. But I, I enjoy this game, although most of it is just busy work, let's face it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's all the persona though. It's yeah, just half well, dungeon crawling and half and that is why I stayed away from this series for as long as I could, up until my good friend Ross Ferris, our good friend, yeah. fellow Team Yuma member Ross Ferris, uh, decided that, that I needed to play this game so urgently, he literally gifted me with money to buy it. <laughs> yes, he gave me money to buy this game. Because he really wanted me to play it. And yeah. you know what? I am playing it. And I am enjoying it, even though I have several gripes with it. Yeah. The characters are likable enough, but the writing is so on the nose, I cannot take it seriously all that much. Yeah. Yeah, that would be my, my sort of gripe with it, too. Like, I played Persona 4 as well, and I can, I can feel just between the comparison between 4 and 5. Four had definitely the more idea of what it wanted to do with its metaphor and left a lot of it to subtext. While five is a lot is a lot more just like he said on the nose with everything. Especially everything with, has to be explained. Yeah, especially with with all of the palaces from then on going to be based on the seven deadly sins. Just that completely obvious on the nose stuff. So the first one is last. Yeah. Let me guess, the second one is Greed. Actually, no. Well, okay, I I am yet to see the second palace. I just completed yeah. the first one. Oh, yeah. boy, oh. that guy. Yeah, yeah, just, okay, I'm just slight, slight spoilers. It's, like, I had my initial thought that it was supposed to be Greed as well, but actually replaying it, it's supposed to be Vanity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. But you'll see once you play the game yourself. Yeah, I'm sure I will. This game is so subtle, you guys. Not really. But, but, but in a way, it's, it's sort of that, that sort of blunt writing. It's To me, I think it makes me connect with the characters the, more. Okay, no if you have to believe the hype around the whole Persona series, this is a complex, thematically rich adult game series that challenges your perception of life and all of that and then you get to play it and the first villain of the freaking game is this sleazy teacher who thinks he's the king of the school so of course his mind palace is literally a castle which is the evil king of yeah <laughs> something doesn't quite feel right yeah, it's definitely more Persona 4 where also, all the more... <laughs> also, here's a writing tip for young writers. Hey, hey, when there is a character who says something about another character being the king of something, you don't have to make him a literal king just two minutes later. That is called on the nose. That is called... Not even on the nose, that's just hitting you in the face, punching you in the face, with how much obvious and phoned in this writing is. But anyway, I've been told Act 1 is the worst in every Persona game. <laughs> I don't even, even know it's the worst, it's basically just the whole, the whole, the whole writing in general. It's, it's definitely a lot more simplistic, definitely more for the general audience, sort of feel. Because Persona mean, 4 had a lot more and a lot more complex sort of adult writing into it. Well, this one's a lot more <laughs> easier to listen to. Like, there's nothing about... Like, like in the first one of four, there was a character that basically had a lot of issues with his own sexuality and such. And another oh, character yes. who's dealing with a transgender actually, problem. Actually, I heard about uh, 
that the gay character in question, most of his story was cut out. So the reason it's subtle, it's because mostly of censorship. Yeah. Why isn't my character allowed to date any of the guys, actually? Because <laughs> he's, he's such a that sort of like chick magnet and everything. It's sort of like, it would have been easy for him to get any guy he wanted to. <laughs> Well, that's just yes, me when I was you know, that. Japanese society still has a lot of limitations when it comes to, you know, social progress. Because if you see technological progress, they are pretty much uh, atop everyone else, especially with robotics. Yeah. But uh, socially speaking, they are very backwards for a first world country. Yeah, definitely. Worryingly so. So... You know, in spite of all these problems, and also the fact that the whole idea of just ripping off the literal mask that restrains your full emotions, your true self, only to put it right back on, which kills the metaphor and the symbolism. <laughs> Aside from all of these elements... I do enjoy this game. It is definitely addicting, and I believe that is a crucial point in my enjoyment of it, in that it's an artificial enjoyment, more than a proper one. But then I saw the cat turning into a bus. Yeah. I love this. Okay. Okay, sure. Sure. All right, Persona 5, I'll play your game. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Well, well, for me, it, it definitely didn't. Definitely, de those sort of like artificial addicting sort of games I have been caught in before. But I don't feel it's the same thing in Persona Five. But the reason I continue to play it is just sort of like I need the points to basically get me to continue the story yes, with all the other confidants and such. That's kind of busy work, though, isn't it? I when I play a game, I don't want to play real life. I don't want to play Millennial Simulator 2017. <laughs> yeah. It kind of is. You have a part-time job. You need to take drugs in order to function because life is so stressful. Yeah. <laughs> you need to study. Uh, not you need for to buy guns and buy school. knives. <laughs> Toy guns. Yeah. Eh. Yeah. Right. And take knives. And everybody treats you like dirt because they have this preconceived idea that your generation is trash. So it seems like Millennial Simulator to me. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a little bit like that. But yeah, I would just say like Persona 5 is the most easily accessible of the Persona game so far. Like even in the it, <laughs> sort of okay. fighting stuff. Yeah, I would say it's definitely it, really, it was a bit uh, daunting to learn the proper strategies to fight you yeah. know, at first. Um, it's kind of like Pokemon, actually. It's exactly like Pokemon, actually. What am I saying? You are collecting all the shadow monsters. Gotta catch them all. And everybody has their own unique weaknesses that you have to exploit to win. It's freaking Pokemon. Yeah. My god. And I, and I do like that sort of aspect of it. Like, by the end of the game, I was just like, I got all my shadow monsters together and I got the perfect matches. And I was just like, yes, perfect. I do like the option of fusing them together. Yeah, in the most brutal way possible. Yes. What's up with that? Executions? <laughs> really? Yeah, it gets even weirder once you move, once you upgrade in that room. Well, I guess I'll see. Time will tell. But anyway. Let's conclude this uh, mesmerizing podcast experience and let's move on with our lives. Specifically, I'm giving away my life to the gods of P5. <laughs> <laughs> we shall if, see you in like a month or so. If my life was a persona, it would be executed right now. Yeah. To fuse <laughs> with another persona. Oh, very nice. What would that persona become? Sloth. <laughs> Just the sloth? Sloth. Or slime, if you will. Yeah, slime. 
<laughs> okay. See you next time, everybody. This has been Madog Die Master. And I've been Y Boy. Peace for now. And we have been slightly coherent. Just slightly. <laughs> slightly. Character, wow! <laughs> uh.